Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Stand firm. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, open to Ephesians chapter 1. If you don't have a traditional Bible, but you'd like to have one and you're comfortable, just raise your hand and one of my friends will bring you one. You can either borrow that or you can keep it. It's our gift to you. You can also take your smart device, open up the YouVersion app. It's also called the Bible app, and we've already uploaded all the notes and scriptures. Of course, we'll also put all the scriptures right behind me on the screen. If you're watching us online at one of our other sites or at one of our services at the Brown County Correctional Facility, love you guys and so glad that you're a part of our family and love you guys. So glad that you're here on a noon, noon Bears week. There's just something about us. If you got your Bears jersey on in Jesus' name, pray, Father, forgive them for uh, they know not anyway what they do. So uh, for the past few weeks, we've been in this great series about identity. I've really been excited to uh, talk about this series. And last week we asked a really important question. Are you in Adam or are you... In Christ. We were born in Adam, and so because of that, we inherit his sinful nature, and with that sinful nature comes a natural separation that that sin creates. So, because of that, we have to be reborn in Christ. In Christ. It's the central theme throughout the New Testament. That term is used 216 times. We don't simply live for Christ, we live in Christ. And so today I want to continue this conversation by posing another question. And, and the question that I asked today, it's, it's a little more difficult. It's actually a lot more invasive. And so let's continue to examine this idea of who do you think you are. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for my friends in this place. God, they are a blessing to me. They're a blessing to each other. They're a blessing to you. And so today I pray that your Holy Spirit would well up in this place. God, you don't have to fall. You don't have to visit. You were here long before we ever were. And so today I pray that you would refine us as you define us. God, help us be less like us and more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I, I grew up a little bit of a spiritual mutt. I, I went to a myriad of different kinds of religious houses. Uh, some of them for a period of time, some of them just one time. Missionary Baptist, Congregational, Christian Alliance, Seventh-day Adventist, Salvation Army. They actually have churches and not just bell ringers. Church of God in Christ, uh, Pentecostal. And it was interesting, but it created a vacuum. It created a void because the one thing that I lack is tradition. And, and that can be a negative as well as it can be a positive. A negative in the fact that I lacked the, the rich heritage spiritually that some people enjoy, but a positive in the fact that I lacked the expectation to have to accept or believe anything at face value. I was able to live out the words of Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Like when I came to Christ, I realized I was a sinner. <laughs> but gratefully, I also realized I didn't have to, nor did I want to stay that way. I could take on an entirely new identity. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I mean, I, I had religious friends that I, could, that I could look at who could possibly serve as somewhat of an example, I had lots of Muslim friends. They, they had traditions. Like it, it was important for them that they would learn their religious roots. And so, so they would go to regular school. And then after school, they would go to Arabic school where they would learn not just their native language, but they would understand 
their native religion. I knew some Catholics. They had lots of traditions, sacraments and symbols, catechism, the rosary, saints, which by the way, there are more than 10,000 named saints in the Catholic faith, which made me wonder how they remembered them all. No wonder they have trading cards. <laughs> Nevertheless, it brings up this question. What do you think when I say saint? Like, do you naturally think about patron saints? Do you think about St. Paul the Apostle, patron saint of hospitals and public relations? Do you think of St. Luke the Evangelist, patron saint of doctors, artists, and notaries? Maybe you think about St. About Peter the Apostle, patron saint of popes, fishermen, sailors, harvesters, butchers, bakers, glassmakers, carpenters, shoemakers, clockmakers, blacksmiths, potters, and bridge builders. I mean, good grief, that dude must be busy. <laughs> Maybe you think about St. Francis Xavier, the patron saint of Green Bay. When I, when I say saint, do you think of uh, like stained glass and uh, statues? Do you think of paintings of biblical figures with halos over their heads and harps in their hands? Do you think of great people performing great acts like Mother Teresa selflessly feeding the poor, St. Augustine writing the words to the city of God, St. Patrick baptizing 10,000 of his Irish converts, St. John the Baptist baptizing Jesus? When I, when, I, when I say saint, what do you think of? When I say saint, do you think of you? That's what we're going to talk about today. This, this is the most interesting, uh, provocative, um, for some people, most uncomfortable message in, in this whole series. Who do you think you are? Paul says, I am a saint. <laughs> and it almost makes you cringe. It almost seems like sacrilege. And yet, yet the Apostle Paul, who, who wrote half of the New Testament, the the most overarching character in all of scriptures outside of Jesus, St. Paul the Apostle, when writing the book of Ephesians, starts with these very words. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. And those words, they're, they're, they seem so out of place. The saints who are in Ephesus. Like, weren't there any bad people <laughs> in the church in Ephesus? Their church must have been different than ours. There must have been no gossipers or backbiters, no adulterers or porn addicts. There must have been no hate mongers. There cert they certainly, Ephesus must not have had a campus to the Ephesus County Jail. There must not have been mean, arrogant, spiteful people in the church. Like, they must have all been kind gentle, loving people who only listened to Chris Tomlin worship, played the harp, and spoke words of encouragement to everyone who, who they met. Psych. Are you kidding me? Like this was a church filled with people, people who actually were new believers, people from these Jewish and pagan backgrounds, people who were steeped in their own traditions. And yet Paul, St. Paul calls them saints, which brings up a couple of questions. How does God see the believer, and how should the believer see himself? It also brings up the big thought for today, uh, uh, the big ask. Here's the question. Are you a sinner, or are you a saint? Are you a sinner, or are you a saint? And how you answer that goes a long way to determining how you're going to live your life. And I get it. You go like a saint. How could I ever be a saint? Well, the answer to that question actually depends on which view of sainthood you take. There's, there's, really, there's really two views. We're going to talk about both of them today. Here's the first. Uh, we would call it How to Be a Saint, Catholic Edition. Now, now in the Catholic Church, there is this beautiful process, or as my Canadian brothers would say, this beautiful process to becoming a saint, a beautiful process to sainthood. And, and, and it's changed through the years. It's been, it's been a bit fluid. Originally, uh, people who loved Jesus and were martyred, that means people who were killed in Jesus' name, those people were immediately upon their death declared saints. 
Uh, but unfortunately, over the next few centuries, the process, it became like most processes do, it, it became more political. It became uh, more commercial. It became more complicated. And so uh, people began selling sainthood. You, you, could, you could buy sainthood for yourself in advance, kind of like a 401k, or, uh, or after you were gone, people could buy sainthood. That was certainly far more expensive, like most investments are, if you get in after the fact. Incidentally, uh, did you know, uh, if you would have invested $100 in 1997 in Amazon, isn't Amazon like heaven and hell all at the same time? Like it's ruined us, hasn't it? Like if you don't get something like within 24 hours, you just, by God, how am I ever going to survive? We don't go to stores anymore. It's, 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 so if you would have invested $100 in Amazon in 1997, that would be worth $2 million today. I thought, my gosh, I didn't even know Amazon existed in 1997. I wish I would have been able to invest. So for people who had foresight and they started investing in their sainthood ahead of the fact, it was certainly a lot cheaper than if your family had to buy your trifling butt in after you were gone. And so because of that, for a few hundred years, there was like this deluge of saints, like people who had no business being saints, were a uh, saint uncle buddy who is the patron saint of drinking bush light on the porch after he didn't catch any fish, and he is the patron saint of all people who are pissed off because they woke up at five o'clock in the morning and they didn't catch any fish. So we're gonna pray. To, why are you kidding me? Because somebody paid thirty-six dollars a month for the rest of their lives so uncle buddy could be a saint, and so the bishops. They stepped in, and around the year 1200, Pope Alexander III, he declared that only the Pope had the power to determine who could be identified as a saint. And it actually wasn't until like 500 years after that, until the 17th century, that the Vatican's standards for sainthood were formalized. Aren't you guys glad that I went to seminary so I could take like these really weird and wonky kind of things and make them like you go, I bet you no one's ever thought about Uncle Buddy, the patron saint of Bush Light. But you'll remember that now. And I had to sit through five years of boring guys in tweed jackets to be able to figure out how to talk about the Vatican standard for sainthood. But it was complicated. And so this Jesuit priest in this highly respected academic named Father James Martin, who incidentally, not the, the singer who's out right now. There's a singer out who took that name, but there was a guy hundreds of years ago, and he summarized the complicated process of Catholic sainthood into 10 steps. So here they are. Here's the first. Number one, be a Catholic. For canonization into the Catholic Church, this is a non-negotiable. It is a must. Here's the second, die. That's going to eliminate basically us. Like, so you, you have to be dead for the process of canonization to begin. And you actually usually have to be dead for at least five years. But, but then there were extenuating circumstances and they kind of adjusted that. And they determined that the Pope can actually waive the waiting period like he did with Mother Teresa or with St. John uh, Paul II. Oh, here's the third. Uh, a local devotion has to grow up around your memory. And that helps if you were well known or, or if you did lots of really good works in your lifetime. Here's the fourth. Your life is then investigated. And that means that area church leaders, they, they come around and they start asking questions of people who knew you so that they could validate your holy impact. And at this point, after point four, you are officially classified as a servant of God. Here's the fifth. Your local bishop will then take your case and he will send it up to the Vatican. And the Vatican's Congregation for the Causes of Saints will then review your case. And if they agree with your local bishop that you led a life of what's called heroic virtue, you are then declared venerable. Here's the sixth. Once you are dead, once you have been declared venerable, you now pray for a miracle. 
And you, you then petition God from your post in heaven. And, and, and the miracle is, it's preferable if it's like a physical healing or the curing of a disease because those are harder for people to refute. Here's the seventh. The Vatican then will investigate the miraculous cure. And, and it's investigated interestingly, and I really like this. It's investigated by non-Catholic experts so that it can't be slanted, so that it can't just be said, well, this guy was a friend or this guy's family gave enough money. So they take, they take medical and miraculous experts who are not Catholic and they examine it. And, and it must, the miracle must qualify as verifiable, instantaneous, non-recurring, not attributable to any other causes, and not attributable to any other possible saint. Meaning, it cannot be discovered that more than one potential saint was prayed to for the same thing. This is not a team sport. Now, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. This is just, you have to be the cause. You have to be the source of it. Here's the eighth. The Vatican then declares you blessed. And in, in a special beatification mass normally presided over the Pope himself, the Catholic Church then declares you blessed and formally proclaims that you are now in heaven. And at this point, you're given a feast day and churches in your local diocese can be named after you. Here's the ninth. Pray for another miracle. Listen, I'm not making these up. Like this is a guy who 500 years ago... He came up with this. And here's the tenth, is that you're a saint. And that's literally the Catholic approach. Ten not super easy steps that can cost upwards of a million dollars. Or you can take the Apostle Paul's approach. And it is one step. Be in Christ. And so you ask yourself, are you in Christ? And if you are, you're a saint. And I get it, I know that for some of you, like I, I didn't, this didn't bug me out. When I read this, I was like, cool, man, call, yeah, I'm a saint, dope, call me. When, I wish my kids would call me Saint Dad, number one. <laughs> that ain't happening. But here's what I understand, and you know, it can be comical to people like us, like people like me, who we didn't grow up in this. I wasn't indoctrinated with this. But for others who grew up in the system, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not like dogging out a whole, like another church. Like it's just, that's the system. And for some people who grew up in that, they have no way to wrap their mind around the fact that they could possibly be more than they are. And for some people, when you hear this idea that Paul says, you are a saint, your mind just explodes. Because you're like, I can't be a saint. You don't know me. You, you, you don't know what I do. You don't know what I think or how long I think about it. And I go, golly, man, like we live our lives in self-pity, don't we? Like I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. We, we live in our past mistakes. We live inside of our past regrets. Instead of what Pastor Reuben said today, rather than live in peace, we live in mistakes. We live in regrets. But your identity is not in being a sinner. The Bible does not speak of people who are in Christ as sinners ever. Not once. Now, 300 times the Bible speaks about people being sinners. But all 300 of those times that it speaks of sinners, the people that, he, that it speaks about are not in Christ. They haven't exchanged their identity for the identity of Christ. It, it sees those who aren't in Christ positionally as sinners, and it sees those who are in Christ positionally as saints. And so if you are in Christ, you are not a filthy, wicked, vile sinner who's been forgiven. You are a new creation in Christ. No matter what your Facebook says in Jesus' name. Some of y'all need to go back and delete some of those pictures. That's all I'm saying. I mean, you, you have a new identity. You have a new biography. You have a new eternity. And some of you can't move on because your primary identity is in your sin and not in your Savior. You can't move on because of guilt and shame. And so you say things like this. Well, man, I just can't forgive myself. Which sounds cute. The problem is it's blasphemous 
Because what you're saying is that God can forgive me, but I can't forgive myself. Which means for you, there's a God above God. And that God is you. And so when we live our lives under self-condemnation, we condemn ourselves even though God hasn't condemned us. And you're denying the words of Romans 8 that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or the words of John 3.17, right after the big one. Look, it's right after 3.16. You know where God loved the world so much? Like this 3.17 says... For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him. So does he convict? Yes. Does he condemn? No. There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is from God. Condemnation is from Satan. Conviction leads to life. Condemnation leads to despair. Conviction ends in joy. Condemnation ends in sorrow. Conviction makes us want to change. Condemnation makes us believe we can never change. Conviction looks to Jesus. Condemnation looks past Jesus at ourselves. Conviction is a blessing. Condemnation is a burden. Conviction leads to a new identity in Christ. Condemnation leads to an old identity in sin. Are you a sinner or are you a saint? Are you in Christ? If you are, you are a saint. And it doesn't make you perfect. Saints sin. All of them. All 10,000 that have been listed. Every one of them had sin in their life. They were not sainted because they were perfect. Every one of them made mistakes. St. Paul talks about his own sin extensively in the book of Romans. It is basically... A giant confessional. He summarizes it in 1 Timothy 1.15. He says, The saying is trustworthy. It's deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Watch this. Of whom I am the foremost. But our identity isn't in our sin. It's in our Savior. When we come to Christ, we are made genuinely new. But we are not made completely new. There is this process that is called progressive sanctification. And in progressive sanctification, we are continually growing and continually changing by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I still still have struggles in my life. I still have sin that I have committed, that I will continue To commit that God has covered by his grace. But they are different sins than than I was committing 25 years ago when I came to Jesus. I mean, I mean, let's just be frank. My sins look way worse on the jumbotron and I mean look way better. That was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? (laughs) Father, forgive him, for he knows not what he does. If you took my sins and you put them on the jumbotron of heaven, they look way better than yours. Like, you're some of your sins are terrible. Like, you're, you're really jacked up. You're way more jacked up, some of you, than I am. But 25 years ago? Come on, man. I wish you knew me 25 years ago. First of all, A, you wouldn't be here. B, if you were, your car, you'd already, you'd boop, boop. like, you know when you go somewhere and you know it's locked? You just keep it, whoop, whoop. and maybe, maybe, after you heard it three times, you go back and you check the door. Just, just in case, you know, that's, that, you'd have done that here 25 years ago. So it is this idea of progressive sanctification of, yes, you still have issues in your life, but they're not the same issues that you, they shouldn't be the same issues that you had a decade ago. We're progressively growing. We're progressively changing. Before we received Jesus, we were in sin. But when we met Jesus, everything changed. And now we're in Christ. We still mess up. We still make mistakes. We're still tempted to sin. But there's a big difference between temptation and sin. Even though Jesus never sinned, he was tempted 
to sin. The Bible is clear that although Jesus did not sin, he had the ability to do so. Hebrews chapter 4 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Like us, Jesus was tempted to sin, but unlike us, he defeated that temptation. And we see that play out in this beautiful story in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus to the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days. And inside that 40-day time period, Satan comes and he tempts Jesus. And when he, and, and when he tempted Jesus, watch this, he spoke to Jesus' identity. He says, if you are the son of God, because at the root of all temptation is a question of our identity. But Jesus Jesus actually ends the encounter with Satan with an identity statement as well. Watch this. Maybe you've never read it this way. Jesus says, you shall not put the Lord God to a test. Listen, he wasn't saying they shouldn't put the Lord God to the test. He was telling Satan he shouldn't put the Lord God to the test. He's like, fool, you must be true. Like, you can't, you, you, man, man, do you know who I am? Like, don't, don't, hey, do you ever tell somebody, hey, man, you don't know. You ever been in the line at Walmart? Has somebody look crazy at you? You'd be like, hold up a minute, player. Oh, let me, if you, if you would have known me 25, I mean, if you, if you ever had, no guy's probably ever made this statement, but I'm from Detroit, so this is the saying. Man, back in the day, man, if you would have, man, if you were from where, where I'm from. You, you, ever have, you ever have somebody, somebody just, somebody, te- you ever have, somebody, test you, like, where you're like, man, if I look at my wife like that one more time, you know, cup you upside your ear you won't hear for three weeks I feel like that's what Jesus was like I feel like Jesus like man man, if you hold up first of all you already knew me remember when you used to have a trumpet come out out of your chest when you was the worship yeah the worship leader in heaven and you try to be cute and you thought people were remember remember you used to think that people were gonna follow you (laughs) anyway don't man don't test me The fact is, they both knew who Jesus was. And the enemy knows who you are too. The question is, do you? And once you know who you are in Christ, you'll know what to do for Christ. But if you primarily identify as a sinner, then when you're tempted to sin, you're automatically going to sin. You're automatically going to determine, well, I'm a sinner. I guess I'll just go ahead and sin. Because your identity will naturally determine your activity. So it comes back to the big thought, to the big ask. Are you a sinner or are you a saint? And not based on your opinion of yourself. Biblically, being a saint isn't based on the opinion of man. It's not based on what your mother says or your grandma says, what your second grade teacher says, what society says, what a church Any church says being a saint isn't based on the good work you do. It's based on the good work Jesus has already done for you in living, dying, and rising from the dead. So I know it's impossible for you to think of yourself as a saint. It doesn't feel like you have the authority. But you do. You have the authority, the scriptures, which 60 times in the New Testament alone tells you you can. When writing to his friends in Corinth, Paul said, To those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So are you in Christ? Then why are you still identifying as a sinner? To continue living your life identifying as a sinner minimizes Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It renders the cross ineffective. So I'll ask you one last time. Are you a sinner? Or are you a saint? Here's here's the incredible news. If you came here today and you were a sinner, you can leave here a saint. Would you close your eyes all across this place? Sinner or saint? It is the defining question for your eternity. 
The only way that we can ever redefine ourselves is to enter into this beautiful saving relationship with Jesus where, where we acknowledge that yes, I am a sinner, but no, I don't, I don't want to be that anymore. That's this process that we talk about called salvation where, where we give you an opportunity to do two things, to confess and to profess. Confess that you're a sinner, but profess that you don't have to be anymore. And, and you do that by inviting Jesus to come in and have a relationship with you. And so this morning, we're going to give you the opportunity to do that. Here's how. In just a moment, I'm going to ask people to do two things. First is, with every eye closed and nobody looking around, I'm going to ask for people who want to confess that they're a sinner. I'm going to have you do that by, in just a moment, raising your hand and making eye contact with me. Once you've made eye contact with me, you can... Put your hand down and then I'm going to ask everyone in this place to repeat a prayer after me. And if you who have just raised your hand, repeat the prayer with me and you meet it in your heart, the Bible says that you are now saved. So if you're here and you say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I'm a sinner, but I don't want to be anymore. You want to invite Jesus into your life with nobody looking around. Would you raise your hand and make eye contact with me right now? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody in here to say these words after me. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Come into my life. Make me different. Make me new. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, we want the opportunity to connect with you, to help you become more like Jesus. And it's really easy to do that. It's just take the card that's in the seat back in front of you. It says, hello, tear off the bottom part, fill in whatever information you're okay with us having. Check the box that's highlighted in yellow that says I'm choosing to follow Jesus. Put it in the black buckets when they come around in a minute, or you can take it out to the Welcome Center. Or if you want to be contactless, you can scan the QR code on the back of your seat or up here on this ginormous screen, and we'll get a message and get the opportunity to connect with you. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes one more time before we receive the Lord's tithes and your offering. I wonder if you're up here and you say, Sean, uh, I'm, I'm saved, but I've still been identifying with the wrong thing. If that's you and you say, Sean, I want to change my identity, I want the opportunity to pray for you. So would you just raise your hand so that I can pray for you right there? Yep, yep, yep. Jesus, for so many people, I pray blessings over them, God. I pray today that you would shift us, change us. Let us change our view of ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen.